Okay, good morning. So I'm going to talk about the global overturning circulation uh, and the recent progress that has been made in understanding how it works. So first of all, let me tell you, uh, let me show you what the global uh, overturning circulation is by showing you a visualization done by NASA. So it's, it's very low level, you know, it's, it's uh, for school children. Um, and so, but, so the idea is that there's this current which uh, goes throughout the North Atlantic and here it sinks. So this is the, this idea of these arrows that are sinking at a uh, greater depth and then they come back southward. Um, I don't know how to speed this up. I don't think I can. Um, and they, in fact, this is wrong because they, they should hug the western boundary, which they don't very well here. Um, and then eventually they go around the circumpolar region where there are no uh, boundaries along the meridians. Um, they enter the uh, Indo-Pacific from above, actually, and then they return below, so this is slightly wrong. They keep going around, and as they go around, uh, this, the water particle, parcels, as they go around many times around Antarctica, they, um, they come up again and close the circulation, and then the loop begins. So, um, why is this circulation important? It's because it transport, transports a lot of heat in the ocean and especially um, it trans in the Atlantic sector, which is this blue line, so this is heat transport as a function of latitude. Um, it uh, transports heat in the southern hemisphere towards the equator. It's kind of odd, isn't it? Because it's transporting heat up gradient. This is only in the Atlantic sector. Um, of course, that, that um, uh, equatorward uh, heat transport is, is balanced by uh, a larger heat transport by the uh, Indo-Pacific, um, so that the net total heat transport, which is a black line, is actually uh, poleward in both hemispheres. But as you can see, it's rather smaller in the southern hemisphere than in the northern hemisphere. And in fact, um, the southern hemisphere is actually colder than the northern hemisphere. And if you'd look very closely near the equator, there's actually a net transport towards um, north of the equator, which is responsible for the intertropical convergence zone to be north of the equator rather than right at the equator, okay? So, so it's an important um, um, feature of the heat transport. And so how does it look like? So one way to look, to condense that information about the movement of water all around the globes, but primarily in the Atlantic, is to look at the transport uh, time and zonally, that is longitudinally averaged. So we look at these kind of plots. And now, the modern way to look at this transport is to look at it uh, as a function of latitude. And rather than depth here, we use density. Okay? And the reason why that is, is because these zonal and time averages are taken not at fixed depth, but at fixed density. And this is important because it captures um, not just the transport due to the mean meridional velocity, but also the transport due to the correlation between fluctuations in time and space uh, between meridional velocities and density. Okay, and these fluctuations can, are, do, are due to time-dependent eddies, stationary waves, and large gyres. Okay, and they do transport stuff. They don't transport volume on average, but since what we're interested in is the transport of stuff, 
heat, salt, um, oxygen, uh, CO2. Um, this is a more important, I think, and relevant um, measure of transport. Now, notice there's a kind of a discontinuity here. That is because this average is done in the Atlantic sector, this average is done in the Indo-Pacific sector, but south of 30 south, you can't distinguish be between these sectors anymore, it's the Southern Ocean. So south of these, um, this latitude, the average in longitude is taken over the whole globe. Okay, in fact it's the same, right, in the two. So it's not very meaningful, but what is, what is important is to see that you have this big mid-depth cell in the Atlantic, which is not in the Pacific. It's just not there. So this circulation is uh, only occurring in the Atlantic, and um, as also uh, proven by the heat transport. And so these are some numbers from Okay, this, by the way, is a reanalysis, so it's, it's all the data, this is that, this analysis here, and um, these are numbers, and uh, this is the maximum transport, which, wherever that is, and the transport at 30 south, because these are something that are measured. So, um, and the units is a sverdrup, which is a million cubic meter per second, and uh, in this estimate, um, it's uh, 15 Sverdrup, um, and you know, there's, there are other measures, but th the point is that I want to say is, is that there's still some uncertainty about how much this transport, I would say the convergence is not, is not great yet. <coughs> yes. Axis, the vertical axis, Height and depth. Hmm. Well, um, I was going to show the, the, okay, yes. So, so remember this number 37, uh, sigma 2, and I will show a density, this, but this is about uh, 1,200 meters. Okay, and this is about, well, we'll look at again 37.5, it's about 3,000 meters. Okay, but I will show you in a second in terms of depth. First of all, so that you have an idea of the depth, so this is about, you know, 1,200 meters and it goes down to about 3,000. But uh, what you should look at is the huge difference that you get in if you average at fixed depth in the Southern Ocean versus if you average at fixed density. There's this enormous cell that goes in this direction, which is almost absent here or it's much reduced. Okay, look at the numbers. This is just all much bigger than 20 sverdrups. It's just, okay, and this is um, the big difference between averaging in density versus depth, uh, at fixed depth. You, here you do not capture the very important contribution of stationary waves and baroclinic eddies in this transport. Now, Okay, so what do we need to explain? Uh, so, so, and the other thing that is interesting is that when you plot it in density coordinates, it's nice that you see how horizontal this is. That means the flow is along density surfaces, except at the endpoints where it's changing density, and that means you have diabatic processes that have transformation of density from here from uh, low density to high density and here the other way around. Okay, so it's a very nice way of just already seeing where the diabetic processes are happening. So what we need to explain is, first of all, why, and this is called residual overturning circulation, okay, so I'm going to use this ROC residual overturning circulation as opposed to the meridional overturning circulation. Um, um, which is the modern view of looking at this. And we need to explain, well, first of all, why is it in the Atlantic and not in the Pacific? And um, why is it so uh, flowing so much along isopycnals? And then, of course, we need to quantify what controls the depth. Why does it go down to this depth? And why is it this strong? What, what determines that? And 
let me just say first, in case I don't get you know, to the end, that f what controls the strength and depth of the uh, meridional return of circulation is the wind stress in the circumpolar region in the Southern Ocean around Antarctica. That is the engine that drives uh, this circulation uh, all the way to the northern end of the northern hemisphere. So it's all coming from the Southern Ocean and that is what controls the, the, essentially the strength, what drives in the sense of energetically powers the circulation. Um, okay, and just a, a comment again about the residual overturning versus the meridional overturning using density instead of, of depth as a coordinate. So uh, this is from the atmosphere. This is what you, if you take the time and zonal average of the transport at fixed depth in the atmosphere, here is the Hadley cell. And then you have the two Farrell cells, which seemingly transport heat to equatorwards. Surely that is not good. You would make a very unstable situation. And when you go in um, isentropic coordinates, then these cells disappear, right? Because it's only one, you see that the sign is actually reversed in the atmosphere. And that's because going into isentropic, which in, in the ocean is density, coordinates uh, incorporates the transport by uh, eddies and stationary waves, which is very important in, in transporting stuff, humidity, temperature, and so forth. Okay. So here's the density. So you see 37, uh, what, is it about 1,000 meters? And 37.52, is it about 3,000 meters? And this is a zonal average in the Atlantic sector. And this is a zonal average in the Indo-Pacific sectors. Um, and time average as well. This is data interpolated with a model. Um, so what is important to see is that there's a very important difference between the densities here and here. First of all, there's a very steep slope in the circumpolar region. Then they're almost flat in the middle uh, of the domain. And then there's a big difference between the Atlantic and the Pacific because in the Pacific, they just encounter the continent, okay? Whereas in the Atlantic, they come up to the surface again, okay? And this is why there is an overturning circulation in the Atlantic and not in the Pacific, okay? Now, one important thing to see is that, obviously, deep and abyssal stratification is made in the circumpolar ocean, okay? So you see that these slopes are very steep in both uh, in, well, globally, in the circumpolar region. And I will show you uh, numerical experiments that show that if you take the circumpolar region away, then um, you don't have the steep slope and you don't have deep and abyssal stratification, okay? And I will try to explain you why that is. But the important thing is, is you look at this and it's clear. Uh, of course, in the ocean, all the density values and temperature and salinity values are placed at the, at the surface of the ocean. There's no source or depth of temperature and salinity nor density. Okay, so everything that you see anywhere in the ocean must have come from the surface. So then you have to explain how, it, how you get um, light water that is... Um, at the surface and you get, it, you get it to push it down, which takes work, right? Because uh, a situation where the whole ocean except very thin layer here is filled with the deepest and densest, sorry, is fi filled with the densest water would uh, require, um, you know, you, if you start with that condition, you would expend work to push the light water down, some light water down, right? So. And that energy comes, as I said, from the wind uh, in Antarctica. Okay, so now we try to explain how that density makes 
uh, has these big slopes in, in the Southern Ocean. So the simplest model is uh, one where you consider the buoyancy, that's the same as density with a minus sign and multiplied by g, the gravity, of course, because gravity is important. This would not happen in the shuttle without gravity, right? So we need gravity. Um, and this is a, just a conservation equation of buoyancy, time rate of change, advection in the east-west direction, advection in the north-south direction, advection up and down, and uh, diffusion. So this is the diabatic term. This is the term that allows exchange between isopycnals. Then you take the zonal and time average, and the bar here indicates zonal and time average. And then you have, of course, uh, well, this goes away, and then you have transport by the mean circulation, transport by the components that do not have a mean, those are the eddies and stationary waves. And um, in most of the ocean, in the, if you have a circumpolar region that is periodic in X, um, then you don't have a mean flow, which would have to be supported by a mean pressure difference in the east and west, but you can't have a mean pressure difference between an east and west because it's periodic, right? So there's no pressure difference. So the mean um, transport in the middle of the ocean is zero, and the only place where you can have north-south transport is in these frictional boundary layers at the top and at the bottom. And the top one, well, they're both called Ekman layers. This is like a viscous uh, boundary layer where rotation is very important. Uh, so they're called Ekman layers. And in the top Ekman layers, the transport is known if you know the wind and the latitude that you are at. Um, so tau is the wind stress, F is the Coriolis parameter, and rho is the density, it's a Boussinesq fluid, so it's just a constant. So this is the transport, and if you have westerlies, as you do in, in, around Antarctica, and you are in the southern hemisphere where F is negative, the Coriolis force is negative, then the transport is northward, that is, towards the equator. Okay, and it is balanced by a transport in the other direction at the bottom, okay? Because in the middle, you cannot have meridional transport. You just have this cells that is vertical up and down. This is not a schematic. This is actually a solution of the, um, of the, of the uh, momentum equations. And the, 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 this is what is plotted here is the overturning. Now imagine the situation where uh, the fluid is stratified and there you have gradients of density at the top. And so you would tend to bring uh, uh, cold water uh, above warm water with this circulation, which uh, leads to an unstable situation. And so in fact, uh, instability will take place and you will have eddies that transport. So this term here, which I have not talked about yet, will be important and um, will um, tend to counteract this circulation. Now, I talk in terms of stream functions here. So the stream function of the meridional flow is very simple. It's just this. And now it's useful to introduce sort of a stream function that characterizes the transport due to eddies. And assuming that they are adiabatic, which means that their transport does not cross mean isopycnals, this is this relationship, you can cast their transport in terms of a stream function, which depends on the correlation between the meridional transport of buoyancy and the mean stratification. Believe me, this is how it works. So then, oh, I meant to write what, a, maybe because I don't know if this notation is known to people. That means d by d, uh, uh, no, d by dy of psi times d by dz of b minus d by dz of psi uh, times d by dy of b. I'm not sure this is a familiar notation, so there it is. Um, 
So then you can recast the equation in terms of transport by the sum of the stream function associated with mean meridional flow and this stream function associated with the transport by eddies. And the sum of these two is what I was showing before, the residual circulation. Okay, and so that, I haven't done anything, just rewrite this. Now, let me just show you what happens if you don't have this, because this term, the eddies, because you don't allow them to grow, then the what is plotted here is density, B, buoyancy as a function of uh, depth and latitude in the zonal average. And you see that then the lines of density are, go all the way, are vertical, because they would tend to be overturned by the um, mean circulation, but convection, of course, doesn't allow to overturn them and makes them vertical. If you allow eddies, they restratify this. They, they take away some of this energy and use it for their own kinetic energy and restratify, and that's the density distribution that you get, which again has really steep slopes because the eddies are not so efficient at restratifying here. Um, so it's still dominated, the sign of the circulation is still dominated by the mean circulation. So it's useful to understand how stratification works if you just take the, if you just neglect for the moment diffusion and take the adiabatic limit. And then you have that this, this is your equation, then I've dropped the diffusive term. And then you have that this, the residual overturning, this is the sum of mean plus eddy overturning, uh, must be along buoyancy surfaces. So it conserves buoyancy. Now this can only be true, of course, uh, below the mixed layer, because in the mixed layer, the term that I've neglected is very, very important. Okay, so this is a solution that is valid only below the mixed layer. And one simple solution is just, okay, so now the problem is the, uh, how do we relate, remember this depended on the correlation of uh, eddies, V prime, V prime, right? So I need, how do I relate that to the mean flow? Well, you can assume that the eddies diffuse density along isopycnal, just, um, and so you have that, this is just a parameterization, and then you write it like this, and then you can ask yourself, well, one particular solution is not the only one, is um, that the f of b, you know, this function, along, the residual circulation is just zero. Okay, so there's no residual circulation. The circulation by the wind, the Ekman transport, completely compensates the uh, restratifying circulation due to the eddy. There's no net um, circulation, so then you have to solve if you use that parameterization, this equation, which uh, looks horrible, but it's actually quite easy because this is just the slope of isopycnal. So if you go into isopycnal coordinates, this dB dy over dB dz is minus the slope of isopycnal. So this immediately gives you the slope of the isopycnal. So we're not doing any work at all, and that's the wind stress divided by the Coriolis term, negative in the Southern Ocean, the density, and the eddy diffusivity, which, you know, you put a number there based on simulations or whatever. So obviously, as the wind gets stronger, the slope gets bigger, and as the eddy efficiency, the eddy diffusivity gets larger, the slope gets, um, gets smaller. And anyway, you can then, you, these, I, I will skip this, but you can sol uh, solve this uh, characteristic equation given the surface buoyancy and determine the buoyancy. That's not very interesting, but the slope is, is important. Now, 
how do how do you get from that to the uh, overturning circulation? So the idea about, the modern idea about the overturning circulation is that, um, of course that was a zero residual circulation, now we do a non-zero residual uh, overturning, is that the overturning takes place along isopycnals, except in the mixed layer where it crosses isopycnals. So, in order to have a pole-to-pole -pole circulation that is essentially adiabatic in the interior, because the, once you get away from the uh, surface mixed layer, you uh, have very little um, diabatic mixing, you must have isopycnals that connect the Antarctic circumpolar region to the northern hemisphere. If you don't have those, density surfaces that come out to the surface, both in the Antarctic circumpolar region and in the northern hemisphere, then you cannot have an overturning circulation. Okay, so here I show three types of isopycnals. The white ones, they do not uh, surface in the Antarctic circumpolar region. Okay, they're sort of warm, warm, you know, light densities. And that's where the only thing, that you have the main thermocline, which is, you know, 400 meters deep. Then you have one type of isopycnals that surface both in the Antarctic region and in the northern hemisphere. Along these isopycnals, you can have the mid-depth overturning circulation, this, the one we're talking about, the residual overturning circulation. Then there is a third type that surface in the Antarctica and do not surface in the northern hemisphere. And any circulation that, that is, develops here will have to cross isopycnal here, right? There's no other way to do it and it has to do it in the middle. And it says, so in order to do that you have to have mixing to be important. And if mixing is small, that circulation will be small. Now, the Pacific is in this situation even at mid-depth, remember? Yes. See, the Pacific does not have any isopycnals that surface, we say outcrop, but that surface both in the circumpolar region and in the northern hemisphere. No, they hit a wall. Okay, so the only circulation that can occur here is one driven by um, diapycnal mixing, but if that diapycnal mixing is weak, that circulation will be very weak. The Atlantic instead has the set of isopycnals here that density surfaces that surface both in the Antarctic circumpolar region and in the northern hemisphere. And it is along those that you can have this quasi-adiabatic circulation. It's quasi-adiabatic because it's adiabatic for most of its path, but here near the surface, mixing is important and it allows you to close the circulation. So this is a modern view of the meridional overturning. And um, and so I won't, I don't think I'll, well, maybe. Okay, pardon? 10 minutes. Ten minutes, yeah. So what are the necessary conditions? This is what I just said. You have to have isopycnal crop outcropping, that means surfacing in both the Antarctic circumpolar region where you can make them steep by that process that I showed before. Competition of wind <coughs> and, uh, and eddy transport. You need, of course, diapycnal fluxes in the mixed layer, no problem, you have those without any. Um, and then I should have said necessary condition also is that you have winds here. Um, okay, I'm not going to talk about um, that. So, let's see, is, is this hypothesis that you need these, so you need a periodic channel, uh, you need the winds there, um, and you need isopycnals that surface both he, at, at, at the two polar ends that are connected. So these are simulations that were done uh, in a single um, 
basin with, uh, in a box with two hemispheres and a notched, a notched um, where you remove the walls here and you allow the flow to be periodic, okay? So here there are walls and here the flow that comes out here gets back into the domain here. So this is a periodic channel. Is, is it clear what the geometry is like? Good. Um, okay, so this is the, just to show you that there are eddies. And the forcing, you, we have, uh, we impose some surface temperature, of course, warmer at the equator, colder at the poles. And uh, this is the vorticity, just to show that you have eddies that get smaller and smaller as you go to high latitude. So it's a challenge to resolve them here, but this had five kilometer resolution, so that was okay. So, first of all, suppose we take the channel, we close the channel, what, does, what happens? And what is shown here is the density, zonally and time average, as a function of depth and uh, latitude, in this case. As advertised, without the efficient uh, pushing down by the winds in the periodic region, uh, in, in the periodic channel, because this is closed, the, the water below 400 meters, about, it's homogeneous, and of course it has the highest uh, density, more or less, right? Then uh, we open up the channel, we remove these walls just in this position here, but we do not, the, the temperature is such at the surface, that's the only thing that determines density in this problem. The density at the surface is such that there is no shared value between the channel, uh, the periodic region, and the northern hemisphere uh, high latitudes. This is like the Pacific. This is what the Pacific is in the present climate, okay? It's too, it's not dense enough in high latitudes at the surface. Okay, at the surface. This is, this is what, this is the surface temperature which we, T-surf, which we impose. Okay, so you do have stratification now, very different. I will show the, the circulation in a, in a second. You do have stratification because you open up the channel and those winds in Antarctica, boom, they push the isopickles down. That's what they do. So you got deep stratification, but as, uh, as I will show you in a second, there is no uh, overturning. And now this is the same geometry, but with, with shared um, isopycnals in the two uh, hemispheres. And the stratification also, you have deep stratification, but you also have this, which is a signature of the overturning, which is absent here. And let me show you in the next slide, the overturning in, in density coordinates, so it looks a little bit odd. Um, this, this is the overturning, absent in the, in the uh, closed domain, absent in the domain with a, not, with a circumpolar channel, and finally, because there's no shared isopycnals, finally when you have an open channel, a periodic channel, and a shared isopycnal, you get the overturning. And this circulation here, which goes this way, is driven by um, diapycnal diffusion, which in this model is not very small, because it would have taken a lot, lot, lot longer. You know, this took, I don't know, 10 million hours to do this uh, of CPU time at the time to do this calculation and it would have just been forever if we had de decreased it. Now, I'm contouring, this is Sverdrup's, you're right, I didn't put the units bad. This is the overturning in Sverdrup's and I'm sorry that I didn't put the numbers in there, they were cut off, uh, but these are Sverdrup's and they, this is order 20 Sverdrup's, okay. Well, this is, this is the red cell, it's one cell, right? Oh, the blue. the blue one is the abyssal circulation, which in density coordinate, you see it's, it's for uh, low temperatures. Okay, it's below that. Um, 
Oh, this one is the wind-driven, you know, circulation, the little Ekman cells. There, this is, uh, they, these are 300, 400 meters deep. Yeah, this is the overturning circulation. Yes, that's the overturning. And let me just show you, this, this was where winds, which is not very strong, and then we double the winds in the Antarctic circumpolar region. Ah, here, th this is Sverdrup's. Okay, this is cu million cubic meter per second. So the profile of the wind stress was like this before, so the maximum was 0.1 Newton per meter square in the Circumpolar region in reality should be 0.2, and this is this calculation here. And you see that the overturning is stronger and larger. And the stratification also is, uh, the slope of the stratification is steeper. Remember before it was the slope, there, there it is, yes, is tau uh, over... Um, this is fixed in both calculations, divided by V prime, V prime. So this has doubled, and this, um, this slope is not doubled because this also went up, but not by as much as the wind, and so you increase the slope and you increase the overturning. So, um, what's next? Oh, yes. So this is now a comparison with low resolution model with um, parameterized eddies. Here we could make the, the diffusivity a lot smaller. There's only numerical, there's only diffusivity due to the advection scheme. Um, and, and so you're much more in the adiabatic regime. And again, this is the case where you have a closed, um, a closed domain, no periodic. Um, circulation, so no stratification and no overturning. Here you open the channel, but you don't allow this shared isopycnals. And um, so you have stratification, but no overturning. And finally, you have uh, open periodic uh, channel and uh, shared isopycnals, and you have stratification and a good overturning. And I'm showing this of course, this is a better uh, calculation in some sense because it resolves eddies, and here they are parameterized. But I was able to, we were able to um, decrease the diapical diffusivity a lot, and I can show you the more, real, except in the mixed layer, of course, we have that. So it's non zero in the mixed layer, and you have this more ideal uh, situation. Okay, so I won't have time to explain. Uh, the theory, but uh, the point is that you can, uh, you can do a theory uh, which explains this. Maybe I'll just uh, uh, do scale analysis. So you can do scale analysis to, to, to actually quantify the dependence of the overturning and the stratification on the parameters using a shallow water model, one and a half layer, which represents the upper limb of the circulation, and the variable is h, the depth of this, um, uh, of this um, layer at the eastern boundary before it outcrops. And then you just do a budget of, of mass, which is really buoyancy, above that surface, and you have wind stress coming in through the Ekman transport, eddy flux going out, this is uh, just the slope. This is just the slope. Um, diffusivity coming in in, a, in an everywhere, so it depends on the area, which is why the Pacific and Indian Ocean together there are so much larger um, wind. I mean, for, for the Pacific, this is an important term, not so much for the Atlantic. And they have to balance the sinking here. Okay, this is this term that just due to geostrophy. So what matters is the wind in the southern hemisphere. This is the Coriolis parameter in the southern hemisphere. The eddy diffusivity, the slope, the area, the diffusivity. Um, this is the diapicnal diffusivity. This epsilon is equal to 1. 
This is the buoyancy difference between this layer and this and the rest of the ocean. And, and notice that both the northern Coriolis parameter, positive, and the southern hemisphere Coriolis parameter, negative. Enter this, okay? And this, the unknown here is H, the depth. So this gives you the scaling for the depth of the circulation, and this is the strength of the overturning, the strength of the sinking. Okay, what's the solution? For large diffusivity, you get that H goes like the one-third power of the Coriolis parameter in the north, the, diffus the diapicon diffusivity, the area of the domain, a numerical simulation show that that is true. You know, this is obvious, but you need to heat the planet a little bit with wasting some computer time to convince people that, with simulations, that this is true. Um, and then in the case of adiabatic limit, then there's a balance between the residual overturning is, is due to the mean overturning, the eddy overturning, which has the opposite sign, because this is positive, because the Coriolis term in the southern hemisphere is negative. This is negative, and they balance the sinking. And so if you neglect this for the moment, for weak eddies, then the sinking grows with the wind, assuming that the, diff the eddy diffusivity is independent of the wind, which you saw is not true, and the depth uh, scales, the stratification scale height scales like the square root of the wind. So. Um, so first of all, I didn't talk at all about the abyssal stratification, but you can see from the pictures that it is set in the Antarctic circumpolar current region. And the driving force is the surface Ekman transport. It overturns circulation, the isopicles, until they're vertical. And then that which produces a large amount of available potential energy, which is converted by bioclinic edits, which we stratify, but not very much. And the, in the weak diffusion limit, you have to have this connection of isopycnals at the surface between the northern hemisphere and the Antarctic circumpolar region, which only happens in the Atlantic. I don't have to t time to explain why, but it's due to salt. And, you know, you can talk to me if you're interested to know why the Atlantic is salter than the Pacific offline. Thank you. Questions? Yeah. yeah. Thank you very much uh, for this very interesting talk. I have a couple of questions. The, the first one is uh, in the simulations in the, the domain with a channel which models the Pacific. Yeah. I didn't quite get which boundary conditions you took on the sides of the channel. The one in which you had the box, you know? Uh, yeah, exactly that one. This? Periodic. Everything is periodic here. So, okay. And so this is periodic. And on the, uh, on the other side, the closed ones, it's... Uh, okay, cut, so on the other side, you have no flow, okay. no normal flow. Well, actually, no tangential flow either, no slip. And uh, no flux of temperature on all the solid sides. And at the surface... For the temperature, this is essentially prescribed, relaxed very rapidly to this profile, which is independent of longitude, and the latitudinal profile is this. This is the surface uh, temperature to which it is relaxed, which it's the only thing that determines. And in addition, uh, for the momentum, uh, you prescribe the flux of momentum, and this, which is the wind stress, and this mm -hmm. is its shape. It's a function of latitude only, and that is its shape. Okay. And, for and you also prescribe the shape of the isopic nodes, right? Uh, well, temperature uh, is the only thing that determines density. We mm -hmm. I should have said there's a linear equation of state. Yes, no salt. So mm -hmm. buoyancy is proportional to temperature. Okay, okay. no salt. So. So yes, you do prescribe the surface distribution, 
by relaxing very rapidly to this profile. Not completely, right? Because this is the surface and it's not, it's not exactly like you prescribe, but close. Yeah. Okay. And yes. Oh, sure. You, this, you solve the primitive equations here. And so you have a two momentum equation, it's hydrostatic, and then you have a temperature equation, which is the buoyancy, and then an equation of state, which is just B equal my G alpha T, and, uh, and then, of course, it's incompressible. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Okay. More questions? Yeah, uh, very oh. nice. I mean, I had noticed that. Uh, Sorry, I got this. I, I have to show this uh, conclusion of the conclusions for Michael. Uh. Uh, what happened to my. Nope. Oh, no. Sorry. Uh, sorry, Michael. I just wanted to. I thought I had sure, a slide. Sure. Uh, maybe it was in the other summary. I hope. What I wanted to say. Ah, there it is. We don't call it the thermohaline circulation. Sorry, this is... No, no this okay. No, I, I've because, seen that. Because what powers it is not buoyancy or yeah, yeah, not no, temperature, I, not salinity. What powers is the wind stress. Yeah, I, I understood your point, uh, Paola. Mm -hmm. Thanks very much for, uh, for the explanation. I had also noticed that people have been using meridional overturning, not necessarily ROC, because ROC is something entirely different in statistics, but... Uh, oh, what is it? Well, it's a test of... Uh, well, what does it stand for? Uh, I can't remember. Oh, okay, but something else. In, uh, if you if you look up if you just Google well uh, uh, you okay. know from your computer maybe if you Google ROC you are going to get what you do but from other computers <laughs> if you Google ROC you are going okay. to get this uh, statistical test so uh, but um, I've noticed that but the point is uh, you know and I do believe that your mechanism contributes. But um, uh, you know people have been doing lots of experiments in which there is. Uh, both salt and uh, temperature. Oh, sure, sure, and, sure. And it works. You know, it looks oh. like no, no, but you just do it in the North Atlantic Basin. I mean, you know, there's any number of papers that have... Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, this is exactly... The, the, the point is this. Okay, if you... This is temperature, okay, but you could put, use salinity. Yeah, should I put buoyancy here? But if you... If you go... If you warm up or freshen up, if you had uh, that equation of state, the northern hemisphere so that you move the buoyancy from this state to this state, then you shut down the overturning. This is this experiment. So buoyancy is important, it's just not driving it. Uh, it's a controlling mechanism. What you say Absol is a catalyzer. So would you call it a catalyzer? Or a I would call it a necessary condition. As I said, in yeah. order to have a circulation, you have to have winds here, and you have to have okay. these shared isopignals. If you're like the Pacific, then you're like this, and you have no overturning. So, so can I yes, please. phrase this uh, in this term? So somehow the energetics is driven by the winds because that's how it is. The power, you yes. Put, where, where you put the mechanical energy. Exactly. Space. But the, uh, the boundary, special boundary conditions near Greenland and so on, Absolutely. They, they break the symmetry in such a way Absolutely. that Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Okay. This would have been a second part of my talk. Didn't have time. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay. Well, I always tell my students that, you know, the distinction between, uh, uh, between wind-driven and, sorry, thermohaline is artificial. Uh, uh, you know, a particle of water doesn't know it, whether it is driven by the winds or it is driven by the buoyancy. And right. uh, the separation is artificial. I, the point is well taken, but, uh, well, okay. But, you know, the, the salt advection feedback and all that is still working. I mean, it's, it works in this framework as well. Okay, so it's not that it goes, no, 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 it's not that this destroys that framework. The, the, this, oops, sorry. This circulation here transports salt 
northward and the salt advection feedback is still there, it's just that it's not mixing, it's uh, adiabatic mostly. So, but, but it's still there. Okay. Okay. Let's thank Paolo again for the talk. And